and welcome to Start Right Here, a podcast where we discuss breaking in, standing out, and the path to success in the beauty industry. I'm your host, Corinne Corbett, and I hope the conversations I have with my guests inspire you to forge a path of your own. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. We're back for another edition of the Start Right Here podcast. And today we're going back to retail because as I've said before, without retail, many beauty brands would be nowhere because this is where the interaction with consumers happen. And it is my pleasure to welcome Shaquilla Joseph, who is the business manager of Decorte. We're going to talk with her about education, retail, interfacing with a customer, and building a career in this area. Welcome, Shaquilla. Hello, everyone. My name is Shaquilla Joseph. I've been in the industry for over 17 years, working with numerous brands such as Burberry, Dior, Sue Devitt, and many more. Currently, I'm the business manager for another prestigious brand called Decorte, and Decorte is known as Japan's best kept secret, and I've had the pleasure of launching it here in the U.S. about three years ago. That's exciting. I can't wait to hear more about this. Was the beauty industry a destination or a detour for you? The beauty industry was definitely a destination for me. In high school, I majored in cosmetology because I've always loved anything that had to do with beauty. And the idea of empowering other women by enhancing their beauty has always been a passion of mine. Were you playing in makeup prior to high school? I wasn't playing in makeup, but I was playing with hair. So cosmetology is hair, makeup, skin care, nails, everything. So I was really into the hair aspect in my beginning of this whole transition. Tell me about your first job. What was it? And how did you go about getting it? Actually, I worked before high school. My very, very first job, I was actually 13 years old. Could you believe? I was working in a summer youth program as a counselor. So my job was basically to chaperone uh, seven to 10 year old kids while they engaged in their summer activities. And the funny thing is, I didn't realize I had to be 14 to work. So when the HR department found out, they absolutely told me I could not work because it was illegal for me to work at that age. Disappointed and not defeated, I still showed up the very next day at 8 a.m. And I said, hey, can I just volunteer because I want to work? And they looked at me and they said, okay, if you want to, no problem. And that was basically my first job. After two months, they surprised me with a check for my hard work for the two months. And it was so appreciative. I really did not like expect it at all. Did you do summer youth program in New York? Yeah, I did that all summers through high school. So what high school did you go to? I went to Jane Addams Vocational High School. Okay, cool. Let's talk about now your first job in beauty and what was it? My very first job was uh, Sephora. And what did you do at Sephora? I actually started off as a cashier. And what happened was the beauty advisors there, they really cling to me. And, you know, I'm all about learning new things and learning new techniques and They just felt like my face was a canvas to use all the time. So with my peers around me, kind of like motivating me, showing, teaching me different techniques, it kind of pushed me into the makeup aspect of the beauty industry. So you didn't go to Sephora thinking that makeup would be one of the areas that you would become an expert? Actually, no. I was looking for a job during college. So I was just like, let me start. They gave me a job. I was so excited and I just really excelled from there. What did you learn there that has helped you through your career? The one skill I learned there has definitely been work ethic. The initial rejection only motivated me to prove to them that I was capable to do the job and I was always on time and always went above and beyond expectations, which I still currently do now. How did you transfer this may be post-college, from working in a place like Sephora to being in education and makeup artistry at a brand like Too Faced. Ironically, I got recruited to work for Too Faced from working in Sephora. So I went from working in Sephora as a cashier and slowly elevating to a makeup artist to then being recruited 
by an executive to work for Too Faced. So I went from working at one location to now working at numerous locations, training the associates on the brand. Did they tell you what they saw in you that made them interested? Because they were watching you, obviously, and the way that you worked. And they must have seen, I'm just imagining, that you had a knack for educating people, for talking to customers, talking to your peers about product. Yes, they definitely saw that it was a passion of mine and I was very confident in doing so. And whenever they will come, they would always give us a goal to sell products. And I always overachieved. I'm very competitive. I always wanted to achieve whatever goal they were giving and just be number one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that's good. I don't necessarily equate education with sales goals, but I mean, the sales goals are important and the important part of the retail environment, obviously. And when beauty education became the main part of your job, what was it that you liked about it? At first, I really enjoyed just going to different locations and really like coaching different individuals on the brand and really seeing how they can execute the skills that I gave them and drive sales. Great. So you went from Too Faced, innovative boutique brand, to Burberry, much more of a luxury brand. What was that shift like for you? I mean, yes, Too Faced is more trendy and young, whereas Burberry was very luxe and chic. It was a great opportunity for me to work for Burberry because they still were part of their fashion house. So it was a lot of stuff incorporated with that, which I loved. Overall, the transition for me just allowed me to travel less, which at the time was the best decision for me. So how often were you traveling when you were at Too Faced? It was every day. So every day I had a different location to go to. Do you remember how many locations you were in charge of? I was responsible for about 10 to 12 uh, Sephora doors, mainly in city and Connecticut. And I managed my time effectively by scheduling at least one or two visits per door for the month, keeping the teams motivated and educated on the brand to drive sales. That's a lot to manage. What was the hardest part of managing having to go to all of these different places? I found it very easy. You were ready for it. (laughs) I guess I was ready for it. I was told what to do and I literally just executed my expectations. That was basically it. You mentioned that at Sephora, you kind of ended up in makeup because you were the canvas for a lot of your colleagues. How did you become so proficient in makeup? Honestly, I became more proficient by simply practicing and learning from my peers in the industry. There's always a new technique that can enhance your artistry, which is one of the things that I love about the beauty industry. There's always something new to learn. Do you remember like when you were first starting out makeup, the first kind of look you created for someone? Yes. The first time I ever did someone's makeup, she was an older woman. She was about... 60 years old and literally no one wanted to do her makeup. And I really did not understand why no one wanted to do her makeup. I just started in the industry. So I was always excited for someone to allow me to touch their face. So when I saw that this client needed help and like no one was really interested in helping her, I didn't understand why. And apparently the reason why is because older, mature skin, the eyeshadow, the way that it lays, it's a whole technique behind doing that. I wasn't aware and I was just so excited to get my very first client. I did her makeup. She wanted something really nice and light and natural. I executed it and she loved it. And, you know, we've actually still stayed in contact after all these years. I actually still do her makeup for her because she's an author for a cookbook. So whenever she's doing any kind of work for her book or any kind of PR, she always calls me to do her makeup still. So I love that. That's fantastic. She got not only what she wanted, but she got somebody she could trust to do that. Again, a connection with someone that she could trust to kind of execute that look for her again so she didn't have to go looking again. And she did not, at least for like eight, nine years, she continued to to stay in contact with me. I even did her makeup for her wedding, which was awesome. What do you think the biggest challenge is being a beauty educator? 
The biggest challenge for me when I first got into beauty education was understanding that all the beauty consultants were not really interested in the ingredients as they are now. So I focused more on selling strategies and linking products while only highlighting one or two ingredients, which increased their likelihood of actually retaining the information without feeling overwhelmed. So, you know, they were really interested and it was makeup. So the ingredients may not have been important to them. Yes. How did the brand communicate the new products to you? Because you get the information before you would take it to the sales team. So how were they bringing that information to you? They would tell me the inspiration behind the concept of the product, of course, include any ingredients and, you know, looks that will be incorporated with the product. I just want to hit on Burberry a little bit more. I don't think of Burberry as a brand that has stuff for me. Did you find that customers were also, like women of color background, were unaware that Burberry might have product for them? I think definitely they might have been unaware because, you know, especially at the flagship location, Fifth Avenue is a very diverse street. Like we get all kinds of people from all over the world that come to Fifth Avenue. So I feel like me just being at the counter definitely impact, you know, it allowed me the opportunity to educate Black women on the skincare needs and like just, you know, makeup techniques. And as a result, overall, it brought brand awareness to the brand and eventually created more diverse clientele. And to answer your question, Burberry actually did have a great selection for women of color. They really had a great extension. I think over the years, they cut back. But when I started with them years ago, they'd had like, I think it was about 13 shades. So at least four shades darker than me, which is awesome. And so somebody could come up to you and ask you what you were wearing and it was a Burberry foundation. And it would actually be Burberry for sure. Let's talk about your shift. Now you're working with Decorte, and it's a luxury Japanese brand, and you're the business manager. It's a different role. How did that come about? Well, when I got called in to support the brand, I was super excited once I did my research on the brand and found out that it's a brand that's well-known in Japan and it's been out for over 50 years. So I was really excited to get the opportunity to launch such a brand within the U.S. and you know really create an organic business. As a business manager, I have the opportunity to like delegate a team now, which is really fun, and as well as be a part of individual development, which I love. Start Right Here is brought to you by Beauty Biz Camp, where we equip and inspire the next generation of industry leaders. Head over to our website, beautybizcamp.com, for more information and sign up for our mailing list so you can stay in the know about our upcoming programming. When you were in beauty education, you were motivating the team to meet their sales goals, but through like teaching them how to like link products together to sell them. How is it different as a business manager? Because the bottom line is what you're really looking at when you're the business manager and helping your team get there. How is it different? The difference is that I have a team that I can delegate. I'm responsible for hiring them. I'm responsible for recruiting them. I'm responsible for their individual development as far as the sales goals. A lot of people may not be aware of Decor Day. So what was fun about it? Because it was something new for a lot of people. And then what was challenging about it for you? It was fun because it's one of those brands that once a client actually tries a product, they're gonna absolutely love it. So when launching the brand, I started a sampling campaign and just sent samples out to numerous possible clients. And we really saw a great return on investment just from doing that because the product itself is really good. And then what was challenging? It was challenging because overall, since it's been known in Japan for over 50 years now, a lot of the initial clientele was more Asian. One of the opportunities that I had was to make it a more diverse brand and really make other clients understand that, yes, it might be an Asian brand, but they do cater to everyone. As a business manager, what untapped skills do you think you're using that you weren't using before? 
Some untapped skills I've accessed in this expanded role is emotional intelligence, which includes, you know, communication, commitment, innovativeness, and understanding of others, as well as empowerment, you know, really allowing the team to make decisions and be responsible for them. It really helps to boost their confidence, increases the engagement with clients, and overall drive sales. In what ways has your business or the way that you're doing business adjusted because of COVID? Well, we've had to adjust our business strategies overall and adjust our approach on how to provide that high luxury service to clients through virtual consultation. You know, it's been a huge adjustment for us, but we're definitely transitioning during this time. Give me an example of interfacing with clients in this new role. How has that been? It has its challenges because, you know, on this new modern day selling through virtual consultations, clients are home, they're more relaxed, they're not as engaging as they would be on more on a one-on-one consultation. So the virtual events become more ongoing because the expectation to receive that sale at that time is just not going to happen. Compared to doing an in-store event, what was it like to transition that to virtual? What did you find out about yourself doing this virtual event? During the virtual events, I found that clients were just not so inclined to participate. We had a lot of people not even showing their face. So it's kind of harder to engage with someone when you can't even see or, you know, you don't have their full attention at the moment. And then what did you find out about yourself when you started doing these virtual events? I found out that I am not as great on camera as I thought I would be. (laughs) That was the one thing that I found out about myself. But it's a work in progress and I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think all of us have been challenged by these times because everybody says the word unprecedented over and over. But these challenging times have caused us all to up level in skills that we might not have been using as much. Exactly. Other skills you overlooked that you have gained an appreciation for besides being on camera? Well, another skill would be adaptability because we have to adapt to the changes that's occurring. So adaptability plays a huge role on how we adjust in the modern day selling. What's the difference in working on makeup brand and skincare brand? I mean, Decote does have color cosmetic too, but they really are known as a skincare brand. So what have you found the differences are between working on makeup and working in skincare? I feel like with a skincare brand, to me, when it comes to makeup, skincare should be first, right? I feel like skincare is the foundation to a healthy, glowing skin. And without good skincare, your makeup, it just won't appear as smooth and flawless the way that we want it to look when we actually take the time to do it. So I'm all about skincare. Let's talk a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement and the beauty industry in total, not necessarily any of the brands you've worked for. What do you think the beauty industry needs to do more of to serve BIPOC consumers? As a Black woman, I've noticed the lack of diversity within the industry, according to brand. And I think that the beauty industry definitely needs to be more diverse in their selection as Black women are increasingly more concerned about their skincare and beauty products than ever before. So to me, it would be a huge missed opportunity for us not to cater to a more diverse audience. Put on your consumer hat for a minute. What do you need to see as a consumer if you're shopping for a brand? If I am shopping for a brand as a consumer, I want to see diversity. I want to see a selection for women of color, Latina women, Indian women, like every woman. I want to see luxury. I like things that are chic and small. I'm not really into the very trendy and fun stuff. I'm more into like chic and more modern day. So that's what I would look for as a consumer. Not necessarily a Black representative, because I feel like it doesn't matter your race. Like I still feel like a white woman can still assist me if she knows what she's doing. Right. 
So the knows what she's doing part is part of that too. If she knows what she's doing, then I'm very open on guidance. Right. This is one of the things that I'm picking up is that it's not just the beauty industry as a whole, but luxury brands also in particular need to step up. Absolutely. The way that they're engaging with multicultural audience. Absolutely. I do think that luxury brands as well as a whole, the whole beauty industry needs to step up. And I also see that it has been happening, that the beauty industry has been listening to the voices and the needs of catering to women of color. I've actually experienced and seen and noticed myself that they are extending more shades and they are being more inclusive. I would agree with that. I mean, it is definitely there, but there's definitely more room for improvement. Of course, there's always room, but it's good to see that there's a start. Now let's move on to our fast track questions. What was the first beauty product you ever purchased or tried? Other than a lip gloss, because I think everyone's first product was a lip gloss. Not really, no. No? Okay. I've heard lots of things, but... (laughs) My first beauty product I've ever purchased was actually a bronzer. Okay. Do you remember who, who it was by? The bronzer was by NARS. It was Laguna. Wait a minute. So you were already fancy. (laughs) I know. I got like a $50 bronzer. Yeah. (laughs) And then I was still very moderate in how I used, like I had this bronzer and it was my life. Like I used it as my foundation. I used it as my eyeshadow, my blush, everything. This bronzer was my to go. And I did that for about a good two years just being with only bronzer on my skin because once again, it's all about skincare. So I've always been big on skincare. So the actual foundation of my skin has always been really clear. So I didn't really feel like I needed like a lot of heavy makeup. So the bronzer trick, which I learned from one of my peers, worked for me for a good two years. I did nothing else but bronzer. (laughs) (laughs) So what's the latest beauty product you tried? The latest beauty product I've tried is actually by Decorte. It's our Comfort Day Mist. It's a setting mist that sets your makeup, which is great during this time. We're all wearing masks. So it sets your makeup, keeps your skin very refreshed. It re-energizes you. And most of all, it's non-transferable for this mask because then the last thing you want is to take off the mask for a second to grab a bite and then your makeup is all in the mask. So I love this product. The non-transferable thing is just so important. It is super important, yes. What's the beauty advice you live by or leave alone? Well, my beauty advice would be that skincare is the foundation to a healthy, glowy skin. Because if you take care of your skin, less is more in the application. And you will overall just have a better application with your makeup. What do I leave alone? I leave the very intense cut eyes alone. Like with the eyeshadow, that's just not for me. I'm more of a very natural, very soft type of appearance. I don't do the cut eye. You answered this, I think, already. Lipstick or skincare? Skincare. I've always loved skincare. How many steps is in your skincare routine? Right now, it's about five steps in my skincare routine. Initially, though, even though I always love skincare, I would only use moisturizer. That was it. I just knew about moisturizer. I just wanted to hydrate. I never really got into skincare until I got into the education part and really understand how it works and the reasons and benefits on using it the right way. Who was your black or brown beauty icon growing up and who deserves that status now? When I was growing up, I also modeled. I was actually a model from 14 until I was 26. Big thing you left out, girl. So while I was like freelancing and working as an educator and doing other things, I still had this side hustle of being a model. So one of my brown, black icons would be Tyra Banks. I used to love Tyra Banks growing up because I loved how much confidence she had and how she empowered young women to be successful in the industry. And I guess if I had to pick an icon now... I guess it would be Michelle Obama. 
I love her style. I love her grace. And, you know, she really shows Black women that anything is possible. What skill do you think you took from modeling that you use today? Poise, for sure. Definitely the way that I walk into a room, I immediately grab attention just from my presence. So that would be the skill that I took away from that. I think that's really, really important. Did you go after being a model or did someone also come to you with that opportunity? The person that came to me with that opportunity was my mom. (laughs) She said, it was either I did piano lessons or something. She told me that I had to do something during the weekends. And she, you know, gave that opportunity to me and my brother. And I chose modeling. So she found a modeling school for me to go to and really be active in that during the weekends. And that was my start. Now, if somebody's listening to this interview and they want to have the kind of career that you've had, what advice would you tell them? Like, what kind of mindset do they need to have? You can give us practical and kind of like mindset advice as well. The advice I would give is basically just stay laser focused. Focus on what you want to do. Have a strong vision and stick to it. People will make recommendations along the way, but always go with your gut feeling and don't make any compromises. Oh, I like that. Don't make any compromises. (laughs) So it has been such a pleasure to chat with you today to hear all about your journey. And I love the rise from Sephora cashier to take her business manager. It's just like, you know, people discount or unaware of the opportunities that exist for careers at retail. And, you know, what would you say to someone that's looking at retail? Besides being laser focused about your career, what would you say to someone who isn't really aware of opportunities at retail? If it's your passion, stick with it. There's many different levels in retail that you can achieve. It doesn't have to end with just being a makeup artist. It doesn't end there. It can just be your beginning. Thank you so much, Akila. I really appreciate your time and the fact that you shared such a wonderful story. Oh, thank you, Corinne. It's been a pleasure. That's our show for today. Remember that there's more than one way to the top. And the most important step is the first one. So start right here.